Доброго дня, дорогі друзі і учасники, і гості, і глядачі цього заходу, дискусії фахової, круглого столу, який присвячений одному з дійсно ключових питань для України – це питання забезпечення безпеки. І, очевидно, Obviously, let's say, dear colleagues, in the priority of the Ukrainian people, survival is on top of the list and how we should occupy Ukrainian territories. But today, we believe that it's high time to think about the future period of development of the country when it should go step by step in the reforms and build a country that our warriors are defending now with their lives. And today we would like to discuss in the Ukrainian crisis a media center the model of security that cannot be set at the back of the list because the reason is that the civil society uh, and expert community must go ahead of the executive branch of power, the president of Ukraine, and you know that uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, the president, has um, submitted an application to NATO and this is defined in the Constitution of Ukraine. I would like to say from my subjective position in the Ukrainian establishment there is uh, some lack of awareness on joining the NATO. This discussion can be more public and we should be ready to counter any arguments of our partners, uh, the alliance members, to remove those arguments so that the country becomes part of the Euro-Atlantic security and receiving a an umbrella structure against Russia or any eventual enemies to attack us in the future. I think this is a formula for our victory that cannot be limited by the occupation and um, reconstruction of Ukraine, compensation by Russia. It should also include membership in the NATO because without that it would be an unfinished process and it will be hard to react to all the challenges. Uh, given that, the idea of the Ukrainian Crisis Media Center has a reason uh, together. Uh, we have conducted discussions together with our colleagues, that's usually not very public, and the fig configuration of the experts we have invited for this event covers all the specters in this matter, because in fact we have a lot of different modalities starting from the arguments of our partners, going beyond the efficiency and effectiveness of the uh, military uh, forces of Ukraine, there are uh, political aspects, national experts, that's why Rostislav Baraban representing a line institute of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine can uncover some of these aspects. Might sound surprising, but for me, having experience in diplomacy, the social aspect and the society aspect and understanding of the rightfulness of the choice are not going anywhere in spite of our major 
advantage of the supporters or uh, overwhelming quantity of the supporters of the NATO in the conditions of warfare and control of uh, the informational sphere, the situation can change rapidly. So, Yevgen Bestritsky's experience uh, of understanding the processes ongoing in the Ukrainian society can be understood not just as experience but uh, an inventory. And we would like to be sure that at the moment of the occupation, the changes in the Ukrainian society will be positive for security. So we will be happy to listen to your opinion. And another aspect. Okay. Uh Related to the segment of the Ukrainian society thinking not about hard security, is the safety element, how important it is to make a unified Europe and combine the efforts to jointly build up a competitive Europe. And, of course, it's clear that the most relevant uh, question is uh, the military one, and we will not go into detail about the front line, though we have Mykola Bilesko from the National Strategic Studies Institute and Ukrainian diplomat Alexander Hara in charge of security aspects. They know in detail what is going on, but I would like to ask you, colleagues, to look a little bit forward in your uh, contributions, because sometimes it seems that we have commands on all the channels, uh, TV channels and other broadcasting channels. They can easily predict when the war is over, they can predict anything, but they command. So they command what they see. And there are very few people who try to look at least half a year ahead. So how do we approach this point? Not just f in terms of the front line, but in general. And in the perspective, if there is an alternative, uh, if we do not get admitted to the NATO? Can we develop and implement reforms and reconstruction in this context? And there are also uh, Plan B proposals from Kiev Compact, like security guarantees. So we do not reject them, but anyway, how do we act? Concentrate resources on something, devise two or three scenarios. I would like you to be proactive. And I know that you, among all experts, are the people to command uh, the scenarios. So let me round up and... I would like to give the floor to the diplomatic uh, representative Alexander Hara. Thank you. Hello, let me start from a very distant topic. Today is the 15th of uh, December. I'm an ethnical Greek um, national living in Ukraine, and we honor the victims of the nationalist fascist regime uh, having killed Greeks, and it hurts, and Mariupol is now ruined, and all the villages in the Donetsk region uh, are occupied, and there is a lot of Greek population suffering from genocide. So I would like to start from this, because if we don't have an option to have our own uh, safety and security of the state, genocide will come again. Uh, if we're talking about some 
you know, vague guarantees of security from Russia. Uh, we need to speak only about the instruments can in, that can enable uh, the safety of the country in its recognized borders. We are strong as a part of a collective West. And secondly, when we are talking about alternatives, we do not take into account one simple thing. Russian Federation being weak in the battlefield, it's a nuclear state with big resources. There is no guarantee from nuclear state to the non-nuclear state. It's a permanent member of the Security Council. They can use uh, nuclear weapons. We have seen some, uh, you know, checks and balances from Washington and Beijing. But uh, of course, uh, it's uh, quite, uh, you know, a shaking ground. So I think that the variants proposed should be reviewed from the point of view if they resolve uh, the matter of security and securing from a nuclear state. And a more philosophic aspect, NATO and the European Union are in a transformatory process. On the one hand, they realize that Russia is a threat, and on the other, taking into account the global processes, the US would appreciate uh, European support in countering China, and the 21st century would be about this, about China, Taiwan, and uh, such like aspects, and depending on what form of NATO will be in place in the future, uh, that's our food for thought in terms of uh, our being contributors to security and in this modality, can we be useful to the world players like the US in resolving those matters so that our price goes up and uh, we are valuable enough to be covered by the um, umbrella of military protection. And the process is ongoing in the US and in the European Union. And we have just spoken in person with the colleagues about those trends. Uh, and Europeans are uh, thinking about the procedure for changing the decision-making process so that a country having no political um, power cannot impede uh, solving life-saving questions for the entire alliance. So we don't know how the NATO and the others shall look in five or more years. So this uh, unclear uh, situation should not impede us from working. We should work at the national level uh, with the skeptics having certain specific questions. And of course, we need to understand that there is no such scheme-like action plan for membership, uh, there will be political decision about our membership. And if we listen to the Euro-Atlantists from Ukrainian side, uh, the arguments are the same. They are up to date. So we need to say that there is no alternative to the NATO, a security guarantee. So creating a new system uh, for uh, global safety, this is bullshit. Uh, so intellectually, we can devise on that and brag, but that's not uh, the point. Secondly, there were a lot of um, articles uh, in the Western uh, media about the Crimea, saying that it's sacred for Putin and he can push the button. No, we must put the Crimea up on the agenda, uh, because if it's not resolved, uh, Ukraine and the Black Sea and the middle uh, of Europe will be in danger, and uh, the Middle East will be in danger, 
and uh, Syria as well, and northern Africa. So the Crimea being returned to Ukraine uh, is a resolution to so many military and security threats, because Russia is creating threats and selling its uh, vicious role and to say nothing about the technical nuclear weapons available in the Crimea uh, and the Russian fleet threatening first and foremost European countries. So everything that falls on our heads was planned and created to uh, threaten our Western neighbors. So I think those arguments in favor of the NATO should be relevant, so we cannot agree that we go back to the 24th of February and uh, switch to diplomacy as if Russian, as the Russian side is uh, willing to undergo this diplomatic negotiation. Uh, what about uh, the occupied uh, partially occupied country to be part of the NATO. Germany did. Unfortunately, we can see a problem with Greece and Turkey. They uh, have a border conflict, but they are members of the NATO. So those telling us that uh, Ukraine cannot do that because of those arguments, uh, it doesn't work, actually, because it happens before. and. The key decision makers, Washington, London, Berlin, and Paris, and the smaller players, are the countries we have to work with and demonstrate the contribution of Ukraine to global safety. And uh, we should demonstrate that free and liberal Europe cannot exist without Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and Belarus being free. And we should stress not on ethical moments, but on the uh, deliverables to the alliance through our membership. So our uh, success is our argument. Thank you. Mikola, I would like to ask one small question. I'm always asking myself, Financially, can Ukraine afford to be beyond or outside of the collective defense system? I know that you were involved in uh, weapons aspects with our Western partners. Can you estimate, in case we are not members, how much should we spend for the defense sector, and what is the range of figures to be spent? I'm like I'm aware of the calculations, but I'm asking you because people do not know: Can Ukraine afford to be like an individual uh, responsible for its security? Let's start from your question. As far as I remember, when Ukraine started to declare its ambitions to join NATO, this was one of the key arguments that the value of security outside of the efficient mechanisms would be higher. Before the war, Ukraine used to spend about 2.7, 2.8, uh, of its GDP on military expenses, uh, but anyway, this is not enough. In order to fully secure all aspects, we can look at the example of Israel. They spent 30% of their GDP receiving also assistance from the USA. So one of the arguments is that there are no alternatives to collective security in terms of uh, 
fiscal efficiency. So obviously, without the conventional and nuclear uh, umbrella, the price will be much higher. And everyone knows that. Uh, and there are some counter arguments. I liked very much that uh, the topic of the discussion is how to guarantee safety. Everyone is aware that there is no alternative, so the overwhelming majority of the population is aware of that. But securing uh, safety is relevant. I would say. That what is in our favor is that nobody needs to be convinced anymore about the added value of Ukraine to your Atlantic safety because in 2010, in 2000, uh, in the millennia years, we were perceived as an extra burden that is going to distract resources, so you don't have to convince anyone anymore in Europe or in the Atlantic when 85 percent of the Russian army is in Ukraine and Russia cannot threaten other NATO members in the East. And another important aspect is that we finally have the understanding that without securing Ukrainian Safety, there is no safety in Europe, because previously it was mentioned in the documents back in the 90s. Being aware that without Ukraine there is no safety in Europe, uh, which was uh, vested in the Charter of the NATO. But practical policies were different. Now we don't have to convince anyone that without Ukraine's security there is no security in Europe. And the skeptics and realists like Henry Kissinger started saying that the NATO in its planning should uh, interpret Ukraine as part of the Euro-Atlantic domain. And this is the positive aspect we have received uh, at the expense of sufficient contribution from our warriors. And on the other hand, the first and foremost task of the NATO is securing the safety of their acting members and resolving conflicts beyond the NATO is not its priority, uh, unlike in the 90s. So the NATO will calculate very carefully all the risks. So this is what we are working with, and I like that uh, we're talking about security and safety right now. Before the 24th of uh, February, there were no acting guarantees for Ukraine, but we also didn't have weapons. Our ambition level was uh, at the level of the anti-tank complexes and stingers, uh, and at present we are at a different cooperation level with our partners. We receive high-precision, uh, long-range firing systems using uh, that we're using in the three-dimensional battlefield on the ground, at sea, and in the air. And this is essential for us, and also given that the national defense strategy published at the end of October, Pentagon clearly stated that the U.S. reserves the possibility to provide uh, asymmetric uh, systems, and the neighbors of the Russian Federation should plan to be able to raise the price of uh, uh, potential aggression. These are important aspects we're going to use because our task, uh, alongside with uh, 
go into the NATO is to become such a, a copy of Finland, having used the window of, of opportunity to join the NATO. And at the same time, we should guarantee our safety and the promises that we have that without guaranteeing Ukrainian safety, there is no safety of Europe. We should use that actively and not forget practical moments. So we need to develop our armed forces, which was reminded by Melinda Simons, the GB ambassador. We need to push the questions of, uh, P, uh, of HR policy, uh, rightful use of resources, to approach NATO, and last but not least, using all those positive trends and the fact that the price of our non-admission to the NATO is much higher than the price they would pay for admitting us, and we need to, uh, you know, tag it all the time. So. The longer it is postponed, the higher this price is. And this year we have ruined one of the myths pushed by our opponents. So if Ukraine is admitted to the NATO, you need to unfold a lot of forces uh, here. Uh, it was Mark uh, a report by Mark Kensian, which was reduced to the following. So if we admit Ukraine to the NATO, you should um, deploy hundreds and thousands of people. But in fact, if there is a nuclear umbrella and some technologies, the price will not be very expensive. We need to think how we guarantee our safety here and now. And we have a good starting position and argumentation in order to uh, become the 33rd member of the NATO. Thank you. Number 33 uh, appeals to me. So you think it's not uh, a distant perspective, and Ukraine has a chance to do that quite fast. And the window of opportunity we're talking about when we don't know when it opens, but we're aware that the deoccupation of the Crimea will put it high on the agenda, and we should provide answers to uh, the society. So I would like to add that Putin, by his uh, nuclear threats, is shooting himself in the foot, because he's demonstrating that the alternative price of not admitting Ukraine to the NATO, should Ukraine have been under the nuclear umbrella of the NATO, those perspectives would not include Russia's violation of nuclear um, agreements. Uh, in fact, we receive more arguments in favor of Ukraine's admission to the NATO. We have some objective side. Unfortunately, the enemy has been threatening us uh, for a long time, but also using soft power in Europe, in the NATO countries. And I would not exclude that the key players you mentioned the US, Britain, France, and Germany, they can say like this, not ready, and it will be formulated uh, as a political question related to education or language, and it could turn out that uh, your army is great, it can push out Russia, with a huge proportional advantage. Uh, you can do that, but can we guarantee that at the, at the stage of the political decision, we can have 100% guarantees that 
confirming that we are ready. Sometimes uh, I hear the opinions that the country is not ready, so the military forces are ready, but the country is not ready. But I wish I could understand what it means, the country is not ready. So the central uh, part of our discussion is philosophic and social. And uh, I would like to give the floor to demonstrate this situation. And then Mr. Rostislav can uh, clarify on his uh, sector of specialization. Thank you, Valery. Let me start from the NATO. I would like to document the controversy that we are observing here. It's not just me formulating it. The discrepancy between the political course and the political wording of the managers of the US and the NATO on helping Ukraine till the successful finalization of this war until the moment when Ukraine goes back to its borders. This rhetoric has appeared after the Budapest summit and on the one hand we can see very optimistic and promising political pictures and on the other hand we see that both the United States and the NATO and in particular Mr. Stoltenberg are quite behind uh, lagging behind in provision of the critical assistance necessary to uh, support uh, our advance in various directions. So each time Ukraine must remind or insist on receiving uh, hard weapons, we're talking about Patriot, tanks, potential uh, destroying potential of uh, air fleet and so on. So you touched on the question. This is an evidence that our Western partners would like to know how much we are ready to adhere to certain standards and norms. Uh, let's say starting uh, from using the weapons uh, not to attack the territory of Russia or the territory where there are no military objects. Otherwise, this discussion is uh, active. It contradicts with the realia of the provision of military or economic assistance to Ukraine, we can see that those 15 or 18 million or billion apologies, dollars are uh, sabotaged by Hungary and Poland, setting their own requirements. So it's not blackmail, but it's conditioning. acting in their interests so that the EU uh, can provide assistance to us. So all those arguments are evidence of the fact that Ukraine is not being considered by the Western partners as a full a scale partner. What is the problem? The problem is as one of the most important German philosophists said is the in the asymmetry between the resoluteness of Russia to use nuclear weapons and the Western world being not ready to such resoluteness. To put it differently, should we continue 
to analyze this dilemma arising between Ukraine, whose um, soldiers are at the NATO level. In fact, Ukraine should be a leader in the NATO forces, uh, having demonstrated our capability to counteract to the second so-called army in the world. And I would like to go over to formulating the internal um, aspect in order to counter the potential dilemmas Ukraine would need to constantly demonstrate a progress in the military uh, action, which are uh, which is contingent on the supplies of weapons, and also progress in the standards of democracy inherent to the NATO countries. So we can see that yesterday the parliament approved the laws needed to satisfy the seven criteria. We need to satisfy to enter the EU. So the democratization process, at least in the form of the legal acts, is ongoing. Regarding economics, Obviously, economic problems, and the Western partners are aware of that. I believe that those considering our NATO application are even more aware. So what they're thinking of is the uh, structure of the country after victory. So uh, solidarity of the citizens of Ukraine. This war has confirmed that Ukrainians have a single identity, cultural and political. To put it in other words, the country has become a solidarity in terms of a political and civil society identity. We can uh, mention here the volunteers who uh, are not fighting at the front line, uh, but they're actively supplying and supporting the army. Uh, so I can give you a hundred of examples. Um, how do you to volunteer assistance? Our army is supplied with the means that are uh, needed for ammunition, living over the winter. This is really essential. Also, communication means to say nothing about drones and satellites. Uh, that are crowdfunded to provide um, ISR data. So uh, the solidarity is in place. What is lacking to demonstrate that solidarity is the political solidarity at the level of the elites. We can see that in the conditions of war, the most important state and military decisions, on my subjective opinion, are taken without the involvement, sufficient involvement of the opposition. I'm not saying about everybody, but I would like to mention the nationally oriented opposition. What I mean? The thing is that such decisions during the period of war should be taken not by the administrative vertical and the president's office, but it should be an inclusive process. For example, to demonstrate solidarity and to ensure our Western partners that after the victory, the country
will not be taken over by one party and will uh, remain democratic. This is an important feature for being a member not just of the EU but also a NATO member. I will not, uh, you know, uh, give you alternative examples like Turkey, Hungary or Poland. However, we must demonstrate that even after the victory, in the case we need to be at the front line or at the frontier with Russia, we have to retain our military forces on high alert. So some extent of the vertical approach will remain. So there will be some uh, problem about preserving a democratic vector. In the complicated conditions. So there are questions. A question of incomplete trust from the Western partners. Also the NATO and the United States as the main NATO leader. And there are also questions related to internal solidarity, which has not been finalized enough so that our Western partners understand that we are ready to the standards for delivering weapons and for risks, given the threats uh, of Russia and its nuclear saber rattling. Thank you. You post a number of questions. And I give the floor to Mr. Rostislav. Thank you for the floor. In the context of the NATO and security, we need to discuss our security arrangements for the future because the previous period has demonstrated that the security model of deeply concerned has not worked out. It's, it has not pacified Russia the we shall help model has not worked out as well. All those uh, attempts to play with Russia have not uh, eliminated the aggression and ensured security in Europe. I would like to stress that Ukraine is now protecting the NATO countries and the EU. And should my words have not been true, we would never see uh, Germany increased its military budget twice in the current year, and Poland increasing its personnel twice. And given the fact that the NATO countries were decreasing their contingent uh, since the 90s. So that's the alternative value of security. So playing with Russia uh, led to overpaying of course, one should strive to ensure collective safety and partner relations. And it's obvious that this question must be posed on the first day of the occupation. This story cannot stretch for 50 years. Should be done on the first day. And the colleagues uh, ask such a question. Will there be any additional requirements, because the requirements Ukraine is now respecting, uh, it's uh, quite a good level that we are at. We uh, were given partisan weapons in the first period uh, after February 24th, and then we were given some more serious weapons, and at the next stage, there is availability of these weapons 
which led the enemy uh, to regroup, so to pull back. So the availability of technologies ensures such security. However, can there be additional questions? It's not even a question. A map of the Russian language, a map of the Hungarian language that was funded by the Kremlin agents to uh, effect destabilization. And it's uh, confirmed by the Hungarian partners have saying that the nuclear energy in Hungary having left from the times of the European Union was, is not manageable by any uh, EU company. And through that, uh, Russian specialists entered its um, market. And unfortunately, we can see the behavior of certain Hungarian political groups playing into the hands of Kremlin and not guaranteeing the safety of Europe. So today, we must briefly and blankly say that when there is the law on education or the law on uh, language on the agenda, it's not a question of the language. It's a question about the youth and the elderly and citizens of Ukraine can freely enter, for example, universities. And I will repeat. That the map, that the map of languages and education is needed to enable admission to the higher educational institutions. So we have to, to discuss today that if we forge history, it's artificial history. So there will be no national conflicts in Ukraine, no segregation of languages, a small diversion and in Russia, we have peoples disappearing together with their languages. So their villages uh, consisting of Greeks or Hungarians only, and there are no conflicts. And I would like to support the colleagues having said about the uh, one spirit uh, conglomerates. And it's important that the society in its solidarity have um, decided on collective, collective sorry, security. The civil society is sure that it's necessary. And this indicated uh, quite, um, you know, obvious over 50%. And it's not in all countries that we have such a high level of support. So we need to act if we want to be successful. We need to be one step ahead because it's clear that after the, the occupation of Ukraine, the rhetoric may change. Like, let's postpone, and Russia will continue investing in such projects, undermining our joint security, and we need to be one step ahead. So Ukrainian legislation should be in line with using the potential of the state and we should uh, remember that there is uh, a ban on uh, a restriction of any national uh, freedoms or ethnical ones. Thank you, Rostislav. 
if you allow me to say a couple of words. Let me say a couple of words on some general elements. Why aren't we in the NATO? Obviously, it could have, uh, let's say, disabled Russia's invasion. It would be much harder. I think there is some uh, American publication uh, saying that Japan was to be attacked by China uh, in 2014, and Estonia was also the target. Uh, Estonia is a NATO country, and in many respects, uh, Estonian membership in the NATO stopped to say dinner. Yesterday we met our European partners, Estonian partners, we raised that question. Estonia was very unfavorable on the quantity of the Russians and their quality, let's say. But ultimately, the Ukrainian direction is easier. Uh, it's a gray zone between the two blocks. I haven't been there for many years, and I think that the buffer zone and uh, if we can state all our attempts to stop the war, you remember Russia's effort to take away the Crimea back in 1993. There were, and now uh, then we could minimize uh, the impact and prevent them from grabbing all the Ukrainian territory. And then Ukraine started trying to buy, comp some, buy out some compromise and was avoiding conflict with Russia, at least full-scale war. But even then, there were clashes up to the military level being stopped by political resolutions. So this policy de facto is uh, a neutrality one, uh, though it was not vested anywhere in the documents uh, but for the Constitution. And this de facto neutrality has not delivered anything in terms of safety. No positive step towards Russia, never paid back. Uh, Russia perceives that as weakness. So Russia wanted to take away Sevastopol and uh, transport weapons to the Crimea. So Russians never played in an honest manner. This is Soviet diplomacy and Soviet approach, and they are still in place in Russia. You cannot trust them in uh, some uh, aspects of creating uh, a security system based on some agreement. We are aware about this uh, because our people are dying. We need to find a way to protect us. The preferable option is the NATO. So the war is already ongoing. There is, uh, there is the next stage of the occupation of the territory. So concerns are uh, much less, and the Russian army having a lot of efficiency factors and HR systems uh, which are lacking in Russia. So the ratings are uh, about the quantity of people, not about their readiness to sacrifice their life. And the motivation is much higher in us, in our case. So Russia kept threatening till the uh, last year, so they post ultimatums, 
so if NATO advances to our territory, we will uh, attack you. And the situation has changed. The second factor, Ukrainian fluctuations. And it should not be uh, looked away. So we defined at the times of Kuchma and Yushchenko that we need to go to the NATO. And the steps were not that big. We were like building our military forces, and then our partners, being aware of our story, we have been building up uh, this since 2014. It's very clear, very consequential. So it's not just uh, support of the people, it's or resolution of the elites. Uh, that's something more concrete, but uh, I can doubt that for many Ukrainian establishment representatives, is quite complicated. I'm not saying anything about the president, but there are lots of parliamentary factions with their internal insecurity. If you tell them we're not going to the NATO tomorrow and we will receive security guarantees, they will agree, and it's a problem. So the guarant the uh, The expert society and the influential groups are leading the way, and uh, the security model usually envisages leaders uh, guiding uh, that. So our partners should be aware that we will not turn back, and any politician will uh, say that we don't have a way back and there are guarantees and i think that the guarantee should be vivid enough and uh, in particular parliamentary control probably after the full-scale invasion or until the full-scale invasion Paris, Madrid, and Lisbon and their perception will look quite to put it mildly, I would say that we won't be able to bear the burden of expenses for defense. Well, for example, we need to replace our aerial vehicle park. And war is not about destroying 500 tanks uh, or helicopters and other military equipment. And if we look at the contract of Finland F-35, or F-10, Okay, if 10 in our case, we can also purchase Greenspan and F-16. We must do that whether we are at war with Russia or not. This is in fact eight years. We have to refurbish the aviation stock. Let's take the question of sustaining uh, a broader army uh, than it was before. We'll have to live in a certain conflict of interest. So socially, uh, and it will be based on the regions. 
uh, we will have millions of veterans, and these people will uh, need to be... These are huge expenses imposed on the budget. So my estimation is to procure uh, weapons, because what we have received It replaced the resources that we lacked, that were destroyed. And to say that after the occupation, we will stop and not replace the aviation park or air defense system. And what will um, come, it can simplify it. But these are tens of millions of dollars and billions of dollars. So hundreds of billions will be the budget for the coming years. If we can and want to get safe from Russia, if Russia does not advance. So I think that we need to discuss it. From our behalf, everything is clear. The NATO countries need to calculate. You have already mentioned that the alternative cost of our membership is quite high. But even now, they can uh, calculate that. Regarding Kiev Compact, it says consultations and provision of equipment. And who is going to? Let's be honest. Reconstruct. Then this is the resource we cannot construct on a factory. This is a different situation. We have to make it in such a way that nobody uh, can approach our safety. So. The NATO countries will be glad to have uh, two borders between them and Russia. I think that we should uh, show this information to our partners and uh, show them the alternative value. In our uh, political domain, everyone should be uh, very well aware uh, what they're voting for and that the uh, pathway is with no alternative. This is my proposal, not to create illusions. And here, this constant uh, tacit competition between the politicians. Mm. This is a unifying aspect. And furthermore, whether, 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 the <laughs> whether it's estimated according to the values. Uh, so Stephanie Shina is talking about the NATO. She is presenting and saying that we are progressing. But there are no initiatives in the parliament, no solutions on integration to the NATO. I think. Uh, that we should avoid um, the fate of our idea uh, of visa-free regime to Europe. So the idea was the following. So let's blackmail Europe and open the door uh, so that the migrants run to Europe. And we uh, tried to blackmail them. So we started dialogue then, because it didn't work out. We tried to implement some reforms. There were 163 points we needed to uh, attend to, and we received uh, the visa-free regime. So Ukraine has demonstrated that it's Europe from inside. So we need to uh, respect the serious step of submitting uh, an application to the NATO. This is the image of the president. There should be uh, some steps 
we should not uh, be you know negative and expect that the partners are going to deny them and uh, they would have to use plan b so plan b is too expensive and unrealistic and plan c like let's think of neutrality and here we go again in front of the new war threat so that's my concern because the situation in the other countries uh, has demonstrated that some people retain illusions after the war with russia some people wait uh, like our Monaco battalion went abroad and go back to business after the war is over. So this is the social dimension. So also their drivers, their bodyguards, their assistants. So if you look at our oligarchs, they exported all their, uh, you know, stuff. Do you think if they go back, they are going to uh, go to the NATO? They are well aware that if you are in the NATO, they're going to receive a lot of questions about their origin of property. So like the NATO requirements are security service reform, court reform, etc. So it's very important, and I have been uh, watching it for a number of decennia. This window of opportunity cannot be lost. It will be a crime. Because then we pass the question of security to our future generation. So we need to resolve it here and now and <clears throat> support the government in uh, the application to the NATO so it should be plan A, plan B, and plan C, and all the resources of the country, diplomatic resources, etc., should be aimed at uh, uh, integration to the NATO. So that's my conclusion. Without going to the NATO, we cannot uh, be admitted to the EU. So safety first. And we can if you like, react to, to what you have heard. I would like to present a more optimistic picture of the situation after the victory. Currently, a lot of civil society experts are working on the document Ukraine after victory vision 2030 as a virtual a mega point that we need to adhere to. And obviously, everyone has at least a feeling. This is sort of intuition based on the situation at the front line and also our relations with our Western partners and so on. What happens after victory? How do people behave? And there is a feeling that given enough investment and energy aimed at countering the enemy, both the civil society energy, the veterans energy, it can be, let's say, aimed at different reconstruction parameters, both for the infrastructure and education. So we have accumulated and under normal conditions, taking into account the need for security expenses, developing the army, and uh, providing uh, weapons, and the administrative vertical. We have to retain it. Given all that, the potential and the social capital 
can be implemented so that this is a boom in the recovery and progress of the country. So I think that this optimistic viewpoint can be justified given certain political preconditions making up uh, the internal uh, preconditions for the security. And last but not least, I agree with Valeri that the civil society has worked very intensively on focusing their political will and their expert capacity on formulating together with the Europeans the conditions uh, for entering the EU. And it was not just the government, it was the consolidated will of the entire um, society. So the fact is that we lack the focus to uh, do something similar to enter the NATO, we are glad to hear it on public. And such focus should be, of course, uh, compulsory for the society and politicians. Thank you. Of course, after the victory of Ukraine, the threat from the Russian Federation will not disappear. This is a separate topic. Uh, it can increase, it can decrease, but it can be interrupted for some time, but this problematic never goes anywhere. So Putin's rhetoric is that Uh, that they're going to respect Ukrainian borders, but this is all, uh, you know, cheap uh, blah, 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 that will be exported elsewhere. And participation in collective security is to be safe, not to wage a war with Russia. And we need to be aware that the NATO is not just about alternative costs. We need to be aware that Ukraine is now assisting the NATO, and the NATO is needed not just as a military um, alliance, but also as a set of standards uh, for democracy and decision-making. And adopting those standards, we can more quickly counter the remnants of corruption schemes and on democratic systems in our political uh, structure and speed up our development in the economic sphere because we should talk not about uh, the provision of uh, weapons but joint production and this means investment and i would like to say that the nato has grown out of the you know uh, parameters of a military or security alliance because when there was a COVID pandemic, one of the NATO um, interventions was assisting Italy in countering COVID. So this is a civilizational choice. I would like to stress on that. I would like to continue and say that we need to act, not just say, and if we are talking about the military aspect and armed forces, I would like to uh, not indulge in self-reconciliation. Our military demonstrate a phenomenal result that we have not expected to say nothing about our Western partners and our adversaries, but what happened? In fact, we were relying on the Soviet deposits of 
uh, weapons and some uh, minor interventions uh, in counter uh, uh, counter vehicle grenade lo launchers, but uh, we would like to introduce uh, the NATO standards in the production of weapons. It was back then in 2000, in one, uh, 1994, uh, back then when Kuchma was in place. So now we have another military review because the situation has changed. We need to take everything into account, but we should not be mechanically counting the implementation of the NATO standards. We need to conduct military uh, reconstruction. There is uh, the doctrine for operational uh, approaches and also PR and weapons policies. Besides the formal institutions and practices, we need to uh, do it in our country. And then there will be another question. Of course, we will be limited in resources, but anyway, we will have resources that we need to spend rationally. And it depends on the uh, quantity of uh, armed forces we can have in peaceful uh, periods. So in Poland, uh, for example, they're increasing their army up to 300,000, having a very small border uh, with Russia. But we would like to have a bigger army, but can we afford it? Because there can be a scenario when army is eating out all the resources. So we need to look for some answers. So we need to uh, be based on some comprehensive approach and resolve the tasks like PR policy. We're going to have some problems and there will be problems in place. So, and the use of resources, where do we um, deploy our limited resources? We will be a member of the NATO, uh, but we will have to face our problems. And another aspect, it was mentioned about the political dimension. Our uh, first threshold or tripping point was not the Russian Federation. It emerged in 2008 at the NATO summit. But the first tripping point was uh, that the political regime devised in the 90s and going back to the year 2000, it counteracted the political regime. So in order to enter the NATO, we had to dismantle that regime. So we need to be aware that this dimension is still there. So it's not just the Russian threat, but the political regime should evolve and develop so that we don't have a conflict of interest uh, of certain, uh, you know, points of power and certain groups, because uh, we are more focused on the Russian Federation. But the first tripping point was this uh, discrepancy between the regime and the standards. Uh, if I may react. I think it was quite a dubious situation. I have worked with three presidents. Then there is a question. Why were we so close to uh, candidate status and the US supported Ukraine in 2008 when the regime was not uh, so different and there was oligarchic system in place. And why is Turkey in the NATO? And Turkey is far from an ideal model. It's not France or Germany. I think we should have a comp we should have a comprehensive view because there are a lot of factors. If the regime has a democratic facade and if they're not implementing the uh, uh, standards of military uh, forces, um, it cannot be admitted. I think that the Hungarian regime 
is more incongruent with uh, NATO membership than us. So what? And it's a good question. I think there are several key factors. You mentioned one of them, but it's not the only one, and it should be the right combination. So for Ukraine, the chance is because the NATO is a political matter, and we will not be scrutinized like the EU on each paragraph. So like we have two paragraphs and separate negotiation on each of them. It can be faster. And I think that the regime in Ukraine back in 2014 was ready to NATO membership. And it is ready now. But I can see a trend in the conditions of war and the specifics of censorship and monopoly discourse, it can uh, draw us back from the model that has been formed in the recent period. So it's nothing is uh, stable. So the declaration of the president that we are de facto a NATO member, that uh, is the first step. Taking into account what you have just said, it's a big question. So who is entering the NATO? The country, the regime, or the society, or the military forces? So armed forces are quite ready. What about the society? We have four minutes till the end, so uh, the colleague will answer them. The social and cultural system is a separate system. Sometimes we pay attention to the problems. Uh, but I would like to say that uh, Mr. Charlie has mentioned uh, the people going back from the front line, there will be a lot of uh, people with the experience of defending their country. And uh, given the historic context, when uh, Pericol decided not to protect uh, the uh, walls of the Athens, he took away the people. And before that, that the people did not have uh, rights, political rights, and they started to demand uh, to, to demand them. So they will not be going back to 2014. There will be people who, who will have the moral right. They're organized and they're directed uh, to the NATO and the EU and not uh, uh, the Russian world. But the other aspect is the competitive political system enabling Ukrainian uh, nation to implement its creative potential. And we do not have a uh, ready-baked recipe for the, uh, for the solution. It's like riding a bicycle. You need to find the proper balance for what you have. And right after uh, our victory, we need to form and shape our system. And there is no alternative to the NATO. I think that all those compacts and uh, all those uh, Finlandization uh, attempts when Finland was uh, neutral and limiting its uh, external policy, and they were just getting ready uh, to go to the NATO, just waiting for the window of opportunity. So while we are getting ready, we need to uh, uh, comply with everything. And what has radically changed? Nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. Uh, this is respected by Washington. So we do not know what comes up after 2024. Uh, so who's going to be on top? Uh, but we can see that the eastern and central 
uh, Europe are next after us. That's why they're supporting us. And we can see uh, tectonic uh, changes in Germany. So social democrats being pro-Russian from the 60s, they gave us weapons and they were very pacifistic. And they will look to the east through the prism of the Central and Eastern Europe, not the Russian Federation. Because why our uh, action plan for membership was blocked? Uh, because Germany thought that we have uh, uh, the Russian market and cheap energy and uh, those illusions of uh, Merkel Uh, so uh, she thought that we could be getting ready. So what I'm saying is that the changes in the consciousness of the political class, at least in Germany, this is one of the key countries, uh, gives us some ground to think that they will overcome those mental blocks and those mistakes uh, on uh, Ukraine's uh, sacred role for Russia, so this is ongoing, and we need to work uh, on that, all the civil society, the expert community, to deliver that message to the next politicians. Uh, so in the US, there will be a change of political generations. So most of those in power are over 80. So there will be new ones. They should have a new vision that Russian is an evil force, it's not going anywhere. Uh, safety and security in Europe will be contingent on Ukraine's being part of this environment, and we need to work on that. So there is no alternative to the NATO, and all proposals related to uh, security guarantees should be reviewed as preparation to the NATO and not substitution. And if we're told you're not ready, we will take it into account and ignore it. It's not a decisive argument. At some moment when we are ready and those, uh, you know, window of opportunities shall appear, we should jump in. Let's hope it's uh, going to happen in 2030. Uh, so let's call it a day. Thank you very much. But this is not the end of the story. This is just the beginning, because the paradox is when we were so far from NATO membership, we had a state informational program, we had huge uh, fora, the parliament discussed. So now we have silence that we're going to try to fill in with what should follow the application, uh, advocacy and awareness raising campaign. And I sincerely hope that it's not only us as representatives of the state and academia of Institute of Political Studies, being also analysts and NGO analytical structures and think tanks. It's not just us raising those questions, but the same as EU integration, it will be a task which will be a common task. It would be really dangerous to have applied to the NATO, uh, putting his image at stake, And should this not be supported with concrete actions, we can find ourselves in a very bad image situation, should Russia make use of that. It's one thing not to finalize it, but if you do, you must be able to realize it. We should unite our effort. And the same as lobbying and informational support to European integration, we should make it uh, in the Euro-Atlantic dimension. And we here in the Ukrainian Crisis Media Center, we will provide 
the ground for this aspect to be supported, not just by the Ukrainian society, but also by our partners. So we will document everything in English and we will make a video and send it to the decision-making center in Europe. Thank you very much to those who participated online and for the panelists, uh, to the panelists for very specific proposals. And thank you for the technical support and organization of this event.